Welcome to this video on statistical mechanics which deals with the landau ginzburg theory. I am Jos Thijssen and this movie is part of a series of videos I've made for my students in advanced statistical mechanics, a course which I teach at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. In this movie I will introduce the landau ginzburg theory and then I will argue that you can use the uh, Landau theory provided you can neglect uh, fluctuations with respect to the uh, settle point solution and towards of the end of the movie I will extensively analyze the validity of this uh, approximation and that is the Ginzburg criterion and uh, I hope that uh, students viewing this movie will learn a lot from it. In order to treat the Landau theory to discuss it in detail it's convenient to take the simplest uh, form of the Landau theory and that pertains to the so-called Ising model. Well in fact a whole class of models in which there are only two phases in the Ising model. These are the two magnetic phases and the partition function of the Ising model is the following. It's a sum over all the possible spin configurations, so all the spins can take on values plus or minus one. The spins are usually defined on some grid. And then we have a Boltzmann factor which contains the interaction in the exponent. There is first an interaction between nearest neighbors that's indicated by these angular brackets. I have SI as J. And then there is an extra interaction which is caused by an external field and that field helps one, it favors one kind of spin. Now uh, in this exponent you see the uh, coupling constants, uh, for example j, but in fact that includes a factor of beta, which is one of a kt, and k is the bare coupling constant, so that's the pure energy, and similarly the b is equal to beta times h, where h is the bare field, and beta is one of a KBT. Now I define the average spin on the lattice and the average spin is just the average value of the SI so I sum over all the SIs and then I divide by the total number of spins which is n and then I get m. So if all the spins are plus one m will also be plus one. If all the spins are minus one m will be minus one and in general we have a value between plus one and minus one for m. Using this m, this average magnetization, we can work out the partition function in a particular way. Uh, instead of uh, solving over each individual spin configuration, we collect together all the configurations which have a particular value of m. And uh, if we perform the sum only over those, can, uh, over those configurations, we call the result z and we evaluate it at b is zero. Uh, and then as a function of m and j. So m here means that we have s summed over all the configurations for which the spins have an average magnetization m. We have excluded the b from this sum because for all these configurations we can replace the sum over i by n times m and so uh, we can put that here as an extra term in the uh, in, in uh, after the uh, z b is zero m. Now generally, if we have a partition function, we know that we can calculate the free energy as minus k b t times the logarithm of that partition function. And so we could do that for this partition function. But it is also interesting to look at f as a function of m, which would be minus kbt, it's an analogous expression. And then we take instead of the full partition function, we take the partition function which has only the configurations with magnetization m on board. Uh, well, we can take it to be equal to zero. And because of this uh, factor, we can add plus uh, minus kbt b m n. Using the fact that beta is uh, b, that b is beta h, we can rewrite this as minus h m. That's the second term, and the first term is rewritten as f 
mj and we use a little f in order to emphasize that this is an intrinsic quantity, intensive quantity. And that's because we have taken the full free energy on the whole lattice divided by n. Well, it's only the free energy evaluated at a certain value of m. But it is an extensive quantity. Now we use the fact that we are close to a physical to a critical phase transition because that's the uh, regime in which we are interested and close to a critical phase transition m is small and if m is small what we could do is tr uh, e expand f in terms of m in a Taylor expansion but f was calculated at be zero, so there is no bias to, to favor the positive or the negative magnetizations. In fact, it, the F is an even function of the magnetization. And so if we do a Taylor expansion, we only expect even powers of M to survive. So we then obtain a form like this, where we see the zeroth order, second order and fourth term here. And we have just given the coefficients particular names Q, R0 and U. And in practice, we are only interested in Fm minus Q. Q is just a constant, so it doesn't influence the critical behavior. And so from now on, we will just leave out that value of Q. Just pretend that it's zero. And if we take the magnetic field equal to zero, then we see that F, uh, apart from the factor of Q, has the following form. It's R zero times M squared plus U times M to the fourth. So let's look at what this function looks like. Here we see that function and uh, there are three different cases that um, have been distinguished. So this is the R without a subscript zero, so I can add that. It's not so important. It's the same R0 that we had in this equation. And we see that for R positive, the function has just one minimum. So that means that there is one equilibrium value for the magnetization that's characteristic for the high temperature phase. So here we have T greater than TC. For R negative, we have two minima, and that corresponds to the low temperature phase. So this is T smaller than TC, and they are separated obviously by R0 is zero, so that corresponds to T equals TC. And so it's natural to uh, take the parameter R to assume that that can be written as follows. Assuming that R varies linearly with uh, the temperature, we know that it is zero at the critical temperature and that gives rise to writing R0 as R times T where T is the reduced temperature. So this is known as the reduced temperature. This picture gives qualitative insight into what happens close to a phase transition. Uh, we see that if R approaches zero from below this curve here with the two minima will resemble more and more this curve which has only one minimum and that means that these two minima are getting closer and closer together until they just merge at the critical point and then you see that the uh, the basin uh, of uh, uh, in which m moves is very wide which means that there is not too much free energy cost associated with a substantial variation of the magnetization. And so we immediately see that in this case, it's easy to have large fluctuations. And we know indeed that in the, uh, that close to the critical point, the fluctuations increase. Another way of looking at this is that these two minima, ms minus ms, they are getting closer and closer together. So in the end, the system finds it hard to choose between the negative and the positive magnetization. And so that's also a reason uh, why the fluctuations are very strong close to the critical point. From this very general analysis, we can find the critical exponents of the Ising model. For example, let's have a look at the point where the uh, free energy has a minimum, so that gives us the equilibrium value of the uh, 
magnetization, and we see that it vanishes close to the critical exponent, close to the critical temperature, and the exponent beta tells us how the MS varies close to the critical point. And so we should be able to find that from the because we have an explicit expression now for the free energy as an expansion in terms of m squared. The calculation proceeds straightforwardly. We just take the expression for the free energy, take its derivative with respect to the magnetization and put it equal to zero. And then we find that 2r0 times m is minus 4u m to the third, from which we infer that either m is zero or m squared is minus r0 over 2u. And uh, recall that negative values for r0, so positive values for m squared, they correspond to the situation below Tc, so those are those two minima that we find. And for uh, T above Tc, this one is the stable minimum. Of course, it's a maximum if we are below the critical temperature. And so if we want to know the critical exponent which describes how m vanishes when we approach the critical temperature, it's this expression which gives us the answer, where we should realize that the R0 is proportional to the reduced temperature T. So plugging that in and assuming that the parameter U, which occurs here in the denominator, has uh, does not vanish at T is uh, zero, so not at a critical temperature. That would be quite a coincidence, of course. We assume that it has a finite value plus perhaps some, some terms that depend on T. But uh, when we take T small, we see that M vanishes as the square root of T. And from that, we infer that the critical exponent beta is one half. For the critical exponent alpha, we use the fact that uh, the specific heat is given as d squared f dt squared. Um, well, f contains a term r m squared, which if we use this is proportional to t squared. So this is r zero m squared, and this one is proportional to the reduced temperature. And we have just seen that this m is proportional to the square root of t. And so we have in total t squared. If we take the derivative twice, twice we get a constant and therefore we find that the critical exponent alpha, which describes the divergence of the uh, specific heat, vanishes. In a similar way, we can find the exponent for the magnetic susceptibility, that's gamma, we find the value one, and for the magnetization, how it vanishes as a function of an applied field at the critical temperature, described by a critical exponent delta, for that we find delta is 3 and those are just the mean field critical exponents and that's a general uh, result for this Landau theory which uh, is just an expansion of the uh, free energy in terms of the magnetization we always find the critical exponents from the mean field theory. So what we have seen so far is that the Landau theory that's the theory which uh, just takes the magnetization as above as a parameter in the free energy gives rise to the mean field critical exponents. Now we try to refine the Landau theory. In the Landau theory we assume that everywhere throughout the lattice there was some average magnetization which was m and in the landau ginzburg theory we allow for that m to fluctuate so to, do, to assume different values at different places and so we replace the m by an m which depends on the position. Now you may think, well, then probably I'm back at a description in terms of the individual spins and they can assume values plus or minus one. But that's not the case because this mr is a kind of mesoscopic average of the spin. With a mesoscopic average, I mean the following. So suppose we have a system of size L, linear size L, then we are going to divide up that system into boxes, and the boxes are much smaller than the system size. But on the other hand, the individual spins, they are so close that we can fit many, many, many individual spins within each box. 
And so within each box, we can define the average value of the spin, and it will be almost a continuous number, a real number, and it depends on the position. But of course, we are not going to look at the system so fine-grained that we reach the lattice constant of the original spin model. We stay away from that so that we contain in each, that each box contains many, many spins. So now I want to write up Hamiltonian for the entire system in terms of these coarse grain spins. And that Hamiltonian is a sum of the free energies in each box. So I integrate over the, three, the DDR, and here we see the Landau uh, free energy. And here I have a, an external field, which itself depends on R. So we assume that the, we allow for the magnetic field to be non-homogeneous, and then I would get this expression. However, there is an extra contribution to the energy which I've left out, and that's the fact that this resides in the fact that the uh, when two boxes have a different magnetization, I will have domain walls between the spins in this box and that box. If these, if for example, suppose that this box is plus one, that box is minus one, in the two extreme cases, it would mean that I have a sharp boundary. And of course, in general, I will have to pay some, some free energy price when these magnetizations are different. And I express that boundary energy in uh, with this term k times the gradient of m squared which obviously depends on, on r but i've left it out here k just tells you how it's a kind of weight factor for the gradient but it's obvious that this is an energy that we should take into account because when the magnetization varies a lot across the system we have many boundary uh, domain walls boundaries between regions of different spins and they cost extra energy. In fact, now matter of notation, I have given this uh, H now is just straight lines and we define the uh, local Hamiltonian, so that's the integrand, as a curly H and I have extracted here the, the terms that do not depend on the external field and I lend those into a local Hamiltonian, which is H0, and it depends on the magnetization, which varies across space. This new, this more refined description allows me to calculate an object like the correlation function. The correlation function is a G of R and R primed. So we take two positions inside the system, R and R primed. We multiply the magnetizations at those two positions and then we subtract from that and then we take the average value and then we uh, subtract the expectation values of MR and MR primed. So for example, if I have a system in the high temperature phase, then the average value of the magnetization is zero. So these two terms are zero. But if these positions are very close, R and R primed, then there is obviously uh, a positive result here in the ferromagnetic moment because each spin locally wants to have like neighbors and therefore this will be a non-zero function but it decays with distance because after a long distance we expect that the spins are no longer correlated. In order to calculate this uh, correlation function it's instructive to first consider how you calculate the expectation value of m and as usual we take the Boltzmann factor, which is e to the power minus beta h. We multiply that by m of r. And then we multiply over all the values that each mr can assume. So this is a product of the different r's. And the integral runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. In fact, the, uh, the value of the Hamiltonian incre decreases rapidly with increasing values of m. So it doesn't really matter whether you take the integral up to 1 or up to infinity and the same at the minus sign. Right, then we have to normalize this. And we do that by dividing by the same expression except for the mr e to the power of minus beta h. So this is just the partition function of 
this new refined model, which is the Lando Ginsberg model. And in order to streamline the notation, we uh, take this uh, product over all the uh, DMs and we call it just capital DM. To find the correlation function, it's useful to introduce a field which is inhomogeneous. It lives just at one position, that is at the origin, that this delta function ensures that. And at the origin, it has a value of h. Outside of the origin, the field vanishes. So it's this h here, therefore, which we take this particular value. And the reason is that it gives us an opportunity to uh, calculate the correlation function. So if we now calculate the magnetization, that will obviously depend on the value of the field that we have applied at the origin. And therefore, we use the h here as a subscript and it can be evaluated as follows. Here we have made the extra term in the Hamiltonian explicit. So H0 is the Hamiltonian without any external field, and the external field has been extracted here in order to make it explicit. Since MR depends on this parameter h, we can take the derivative with respect to that h, and that means that these two terms in the numerator and the denominator in those intervals, they will give contributions. In fact, what we do is we take the derivative, and after having done that, we take h equal to 0. And then the result is, well, the first term you can easily see, if we take the derivative with respect to this h, we get an extra term minus beta times m0 in the expectation value. Then there is also a contribution from the terms in the denominator. And if I take those into account, I get this expression. So I get two uh, expectation values, the expectation value of um, mr and that of m0. So this is the expectation value of m0 times mr, and this is the expectation value of mr and m0. And if we now go back to the definition of the correlation function, you see that in fact this is exactly what we have calculated here. So we have to obtain the result that if I apply a small magnetic field at the origin and then I take the derivative of the magnetization throughout the lattice with respect to that field, I get the, I obtain the uh, correlation function with an extra factor of minus beta. And this result, it's a rather general result which you can derive in many different contexts. It's called the fluctuation response theorem. Now let us go back to the partition function and ask ourselves the question, which configurations of M give a major contribution to this partition function if we evaluate that multidimensional integral? So this is the question that we now address. And uh, in mathematics, there is a famous result, which is called the saddle point approximation. If we have an integral of an exponential and the exponent assumes very big values, then that integral is usually dominated by the maxima of the exponent. The reason is that if you uh, just change f here a little bit, because the lambda is assumed to be large, the prefactor is assumed to be large, you see that the not optimal contributions uh, are suppressed very strongly by the large value of lambda. So the idea is now to generalize that notion to the problem we are dealing with. So we try to find those fields M of R which give us the optimal contribution to this exponent. In order to find those dominant contributions, we use, the, we use the variational condition. So if we have an optimum of this Hamiltonian, we evaluate it for a certain field M, which we vary a little bit to M plus delta M, and then the difference with the, not, uh, the unvaried field uh, that should vanish to first order in the variation delta M. Here I've written now that variation uh, a word about notation, I've left out all the R dependencies except for the external field, um, otherwise the, the notation would become too complicated. Uh, 
And uh, you should not confuse this parameter r, which is just a parameter which tells you, which is just the prefactor in the Taylor expansion of the Hamiltonian of this m squared, uh, that should not be confused with the r as a position. Apart from that, this is just straightforwardly writing out what I had here. This is the expression with m plus delta m, and this is without, and I subtracted 2, and now this should vanish to first order in delta m. So here I've worked out that difference, keeping only the terms linear in delta m. So from this we neglect the uh, delta m squared term, and uh, after subtracting this term, the only term which is left is this one, 2 times uh, gradient m delta gradient delta m. Here we have just a simple term linear in delta m, and from these we have thrown away all the higher powers of delta m. So I get 2rm delta m and 4um to the third delta m. Now I can use Green's theorem in order to uh, move the gradient here from the, delta, from the delta m to the m, and then I get the expression minus 2k times gradient squared m plus hr plus 2rm plus 4um to the third, and I've been able to extract the delta m from the uh, integrand, and if I want this to be zero for all small variations delta m, then that is only possible if the term in parentheses is always equal to zero. And so that's an important equation we have found. It is useful now to make a little pause and uh, realize what we are doing. So previously we have seen that applying a small field at the origin uh, gives us a magnetization that depends on the field, and if we take the derivative of that magnetization we obtain the correlation function. Now what we are doing now is an attempt to calculate this magnetization as a function of the field, and we do that using the settle point approximation, so we find the optimum contributions, the, the ones that give a dominant contribution in the partition function. Uh, we will take that m, which comes out of this equation, we take the derivative with respect to the field, we, take, we restore again the h times delta r for this field, and that tells us then what the correlation function actually is. And that's the goal of the exercise here. So this is the equation that we need to solve for m. <coughs> and what we do now is, because the field h is very small, we use perturbation theory with respect to this small parameter. And if h really would be zero, then the solution would be just a m which is constant throughout the lattice. So if h is zero, then we know the solution for t above tc and t below tc. Above tc, the stable point was m0 is zero. It doesn't vary with r because h is zero. And below the tc, it's just the one of the two values m0 is plus or minus the square root of r over 2u. And when we switch on this small field, the MR will be just slightly different from the M0, and we parameterize that as H times phi R. So we do linear perturbation. And the equations for phi R are now what we need to solve. If T is above TC, we just have M R is H times phi R. Phi uh, h is a small number, so we plug that into this uh, equation. We collect all the terms that are linear in h. So here, this is the first term, minus 2k gradient squared phi, we divide by h. So here also the h drops out, as it does here. And this term is proportional to h to the third, so even if we divide by h, it's a lot smaller than the other terms. And that gives us this Helmholtz type of equation where I want to emphasize once more that this r is a parameter and it is not a position. We proceed along the same lines for t smaller than t0, and then apart from terms which vanish because uh, m0 satisfies this equation, those are the terms that do not scale with h, they all vanish. Uh, 
and the terms that scale linearly with h have been collected here. And in addition to the terms that we see here, there is one extra term due to the fact that m0 is non-zero, which now pops up, and that's 3u m0 squared times phi. If we then use the fact that m0 squared is minus r over 2u, we can rework this equation into gradient squared phi plus 2r over k phi is delta r over k. So it resembles this equation quite a lot, but uh, we should uh, recall that above tc the r here is positive, below tc the r is negative, and we see that there is an extra effect of 2 which has arisen. So we have two Helmholtz type of equations. In both cases we arrive at a Helmholtz equation which has this form, gradient squared minus 1 over a length squared, that's the correlation length, acting on phi gives something which is proportional to a delta function. And this uh, equation has uh, two asymptotic solutions, one for large r, then it's uh, some power of the length of r by an, uh, multiplied by a decaying exponential, and it has the same form but with a different exponent for r uh, in the case where r is much smaller than xi. So xi is the correlation length and we can relate it to k of r, that's it's immediately clear when comparing this equation uh, with the form of the Helmholtz equation here, you see that 1 over xi squared is r over k, so Xi is always proportional to the square root of k of r. And we find therefore that uh, Xi is proportional to 1 over the reduced temperature because the parameter r was proportional to the reduced temperature. Uh, that's just generally, we know that for Xi we have the form t to the power minus nu, where nu is a critical exponent, and so we have found that critical exponent for the correlation length is equal to 1 half. Now let us uh, recall what we have seen a few minutes ago. We have seen that um, if we switch on a small field uh, at the origin, we have a magnetization which varies in space. It's a constant plus a small perturbation caused by the field. And we have also seen that the correlation function is given as dmdh, and so we see immediately that a correlation function is nothing but phi r, that's the solution to our Helmholtz equation. So we can now conclude that at a critical point where we anticipate that the correlation length goes to infinity, the typical situation we are in is that we are looking at length scales that are shorter than xi. Now let's go back to the solution to the Helmholtz equation in that regime, so r smaller than xi. It has a prefactor of r to the power minus, uh, 2 minus d, and so we know that the solution can be written as e to the power minus r of xi. Now r here is really a length, it's not the parameter, and here we have r in the power d, min d minus 2. So that is phi, so that's also proportional to the correlation function, and generally the correlation function at the critical point is defined as 1 over r to the power d minus 2 plus eta, and because we are in the regime where r is much smaller than psi, we can neglect the numerator, and we see that we have found that eta, which is the correlation function a critical exponent, is zero in this so-called Landau-Ginzburg theory, in which we have allowed the magnetization to vary in space. As a summary, I have listed a few of the exponents that we have found, alpha, beta, gamma, and nu, and here you see the Landau-Ginzburg values on the left, and on the right-hand side those are experiments for three dimensions, and you see that we are not uh, doing very badly, but also not very accurately. Deviations from the experimental values are obviously due to the approximations that we have made. And the most important approximation was so far that we have neglected the fluctuations of the magnetization with respect to the settle point value. The question as to what extent is it justified to replace the actual magnetization by its settle point value was addressed by Vitaly Ginzburg and Levanyuk. Going back to the place where we derived the settle point equations, 
uh, recall we took the Hamiltonian and expanded it to first order in delta m and then we integrated over space and then required that the variation would be zero. That was a first order expansion and we have neglected the second order terms and the question is now how important are these second order terms? You can see here that there arises a second order term from the gradient, there is a second order term from r and there is a second order term in delta m arising from u. These terms can be worked out straightforwardly and we find this expression which is indeed quadratic in the fluctuation m. Uh, moreover there is an m0 squared here uh, that is because that's the point around which we did the second order expansion. So if we want to assess the validity of the neglect of the second order co contributions we should check whether this term is smaller than the zeroth order expansion. So the uh, Hamiltonian involving the m0 found from the settle point approximation. This criterion is obviously satisfied when we choose the delta mr such that it's square on average is a lot smaller than m0 squared. And this condition is known as the Ginzburg criterion. So the Ginzburg criterion tells us how justified the saddle point approximation in the Lando Ginzburg Hamiltonian was. In order to analyze this criterion, we define the magnetization on the entire lattice, which is 1 over the volume times the volume integral over the local magnetization MR. As we are interested in the fluctuations of the local magnetization, we start by looking at the fluctuations of the global magnetization. And I have uh, moved the factor of 1 over v squared in the right-hand side to the left. The delta m squared is then defined up to this factor of v squared as the magnetization squared and then expectation value. Those are two independent uh, integrals, hence two different integration variables, r and r primed. And we subtract from those the average magnetization squared. And uh, just in order to uh, facilitate the, the next step, I have written those two as an integral over r and as an integral over r primed. The next step is then to move the uh, angular brackets denoting the average value inside the integral. And then we have here a term in parentheses, which is mr, mr primed expectation value minus the expectation value squared. And that's recognized as the correlation function, the gr of r and r primed. So we obtain just this double integral over r and r primed of gr and r primed. Uh, but we should realize that if we are close to, but not exactly at the critical point, the correlation length, in, length is finite. And in the thermodynamic limit, we can take the V arbitrarily large. So we take V, the volume, uh, a lot larger than Xi to the power D, or Xi is a lot smaller than the linear size of the domain. And that means that the vast majority uh, of contributions to this integral arises from terms where r and r primed are both uh, far from the uh, boundary of the system and far from the boundary means a lot farther than the correlation length. And in that case, if the dominant contribution comes from points who do not, which do not feel the boundary of the system, it makes sense to transfer the uh, integration variables r and r primed to new integration variables, one for the center of mass and one for the relative coordinate r minus r primed. And the g, the correlation function, is then assumed to depend only on s which is r minus r primed and in particular because of the rotational symmetry we don't see the uh, structure of the individual lattice points anymore it depends only on the size of s
So this implies that the integral of g r and r primed over both r and r primed can now be written as v, which arises from an integral over the center of mass coordinate, because we can put this pair and uh, this pair anywhere in the volume, and then we have an integral only over g uh, of the s, which only depends on the size of s, over the coordinate s. So using radial coordinates. We can rewrite the integral as some factor, which is 2 pi or 4 pi or something like that. So it's a factor of order 1, I call it c here. And then we have an integral of gs times s to the power d minus 1 ds. And here I have copied the uh, formula for g as a function of the distance s that we have obtained above. And we see that it decays exponentially and before xi, so at, uh, for s a lot smaller than, uh, than xi the form 1 over s to the power d minus 2 dominates. So we can approximate this integral as v times c, and then we integrate just from 0 to xi, and then we have 1 over s and the power d minus 2, and we had a s to the power d minus 1 times ds. So we see that we have an integral over s ds, and that directly gives me v times xi squared, where I've left out the c because that's a constant, as mentioned before, of order 1. So it doesn't really affect the scaling behavior. And recalling what we were calculating, it was v squared times the m squared. we see that delta m squared expectation value is equal to xi squared over v. And let us recall that the capital M is the average value of the local magnetization and what we are interested in is in fact the fluctuation of that local magnetization which is the actual deviation of the, it's the deviation of the actual value of the magnetization from the average value which is m0 that is the value that is imposed by the saddle point approximation let's now make a cartoon of the system and i can do that unfortunately only in one dimension so here is the r that's a coordinate which runs through the volume of the system and vertically I put MR and the average value of MR is M0 so this is some finite height which is M0 which is the average magnetization let us assume that we are below the t critical temperature so that M0 is non-zero itself the magnetization will have different values. It will sometimes be larger than the average value, then it will be smaller. And so we see typically such a rather erratic behavior. Sometimes there are longer patches where it is above or below the average magnetization, but this is typically what we could expect. And the size of the domains in which the magnetization has uh, only one sign with respect to M0, so where the delta M has only one sign, the size of those domains is typically given by the correlation length Xi. That's in fact what Xi means. It's the uh, length over which the magnet magnetic moments influence each other effectively. And so it's the size of these patches. And so that means that this delta M squared is the result of an average over fluctuations that we see over the lattice. So the picture which emerges is that we have a volume consisting of different patches and within each patch we have an independent value of the magnetization with a typical uh, deviation which is the same in each patch but it can be positive or negative. And the size of the patches is xi to the power d so we have patches of volume xi to the power d and the number of those patches is given by v divided by that volume per patch.
So let's call the number of batches n. Then we know that the average of all the of the values of the magnetization in all these patches is typically smaller than the value in each patch itself, and it scales by one over the square root of n. And putting in the correct expressions now, the delta m was a kind of shorthand writing that should obviously be the square root of the expectation value of delta m r squared and the n we know that that is v over xi to the power d. So taking the square of the left and right hand side we can write the delta m squared expectation value explicitly as delta capital M squared times v over xi to the power d by bringing this one to the other side. Now delta m squared is something we had already analyzed before and we had found then that it uh, can be written as xi squared over v. So if we plug that value in we find that delta m r squared can be written as xi to the power 2 minus d and using the fact that xi is 1 over the square root of t where t is the reduced temperature we can write this also as t to the power d minus 2 over 2 and the requirement for neglecting the fluctuations is that this should be a lot smaller than m0 squared and the m0 squared when we approach tc will take on the value of t so what we find is that t to the power d minus 2 over 2 should be much smaller than t itself Taking now the expression of delta m squared in terms of t and that for the, uh, m0 squared in terms of t, we see that their ratio is given by t to the power d minus 4 over 2. And this should be small if the Ginzburg criterion is justified. So this uh, should be a lot smaller than 1. In that case, we can neglect the fluctuations with respect to the average value of m. And we see that that holds indeed for d greater than 4. So for d larger than 4, we can expect that the mean field theory gives us correct results. And the deviations that we previously have seen for d is 3, uh, they arise from, in fact, an unjustified approximation in which we have neglected all the fluctuations.